Hello and welcome to the On Stage Colorado Podcast for May 7th. I'm Alex Miller here again with arts reporter Tony Tresca. Hey, Tony. Hey, Alex. How's it going? It's going great. I was, uh, we were both out at the theater last night as usual. So uh, right now uh, we're recording on May 4th, the Star Wars Day, which is kind of like the geek's holiday, I guess, of, 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 of a kind. But, uh, I know there's a few things going on. Certainly Audacious Theater's Star Wars uh, spoof may the what the heck is it called again? We we uh, <laughs> uh, may uh the space far, conflicts. May the sparse be with you, space conflicts. Yeah. yeah. So th- they'll have a show tonight, at, I believe, at Fiction Brewery. So uh, that's one one way you can celebrate. It's probably sold out. But um, anyway, we'll review some of the latest shows as we usually do that we've uh, seen uh, or reviewed, as well as uh, take a look ahead at what's coming up around stages in Colorado. And then a little later in the pod, uh, as we gear up for the Denver Fringe Festival in early June, I've got an interview with Lauren Hans. So she actually reached out to me. She has a podcast also. It's called What the Fringe, and it's all about Fringe Festivals. So, uh, And she also is a performer. She has her own one-woman show coming to Denver Fringe called Holy O, which is about a woman who kind of wants to become a nun, doesn't want to give up her vibrators. So that's her story there. Um <laughs> But yeah, I was listening to the Fringe is such an interesting subculture, you know, because they have them all over the world. And and uh, I was listening to uh, her podcast this morning. She had a new one out, uh, and she was interviewing a woman who uh, started a Fringe festival in Kress, Croatia. Kress is a is an island off the coast of Croatia, and this German woman who'd moved there uh, is a burlesque performer, and so she started a, a Fringe festival there. And it's just like it's just fascinating to listen to uh, you know. Uh, all that, all that uh, fringe stuff that's going on out there. So it's exciting that we've got one in Denver. Thanks to thanks to Anne Sabah, who started it a few years ago. Yeah, we're on year five of the Denver Fringe Festival, and I know this year is amping up to be the biggest fringe uh, in Denver's history to date. They've got more venues, more performers. I mean, my inbox is already being flooded with the onslaught of uh, <laughs> press releases from all the various fringe performers, which I'm loving because I'm getting everything from like American Horror Story to Josie's Diner and Immersive Experience. So uh-huh. like, it's it's just fun to see the variety of shows and performers who are coming in both locally as well as people who are coming into Colorado just to perform. Yeah, yeah, same here. I'm getting all those emails and it's a little tricky to try and you know, it's it's impossible to do a story or something about every single one of these shows. There's so many of them, but we are going to be out there covering covering these shows when they come around. I know you're going to be out of town, unfortunately, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll uh, have uh, have some folks out there covering some of these and uh, give people an idea of what's going on. So, indeed, at the fringe only. My only note is maybe don't schedule it around graduation season. Uh, and yeah. I was like, my cousin's got a graduation, and I know it's a, this is a New York graduation, so maybe it's not fair to hold Denver to New York graduation schedule. Yeah, but. <laughs> in Colorado, all the graduations are usually done by the end of May. So, um, so uh, Tony, I, I, I was out on a walk this morning with Macy, Macy, my dog, and uh, I, I, I found myself critiquing a robin, and here's what happened. I saw, this, more. <laughs> I saw this robin and it was pulling a worm out of the ground and i just looked at it and i said oh my god that is so cliche <laughs> wow Alex i know it's like I, I can i am not having it for this early bird getting the worm i will not stand for it i know it's such an old trope but you know it was just doing what robins do and, and if it's a cliche <laughs> i guess the robin can't help it but maybe i've been doing uh critiquing things for too long you know, it's funny, uh, we have a, a, a high school reunion coming up for Summit High School, which is up in, uh, you know, near Breckenridge, where I graduated high school. And and um, I was looking through some of my old things, because I knew I had some copies of Tiger Tracks, which was the newspaper, or still is the newspaper, as far as I know, at Summit High. And I somehow or another, I just kind of stuck them on the bottom of a box of clips. And so they've been there for 40 plus years. <laughs> uh, but I was looking, one of, the, one of the things that I used to write was album reviews. Uh, in in tiger tracks and i was i was looking at some of them and i was just a pompous little ass at the time or arrogant i guess you'd say you know but i mean i I read one of uh the cars uh shake it up i think was the album that just come out and i was like really disparaging of it and now i'm like i love that album i don't know face (laughs) change stays changed but um anyway so well uh i know there's a bunch of stuff we want to get to today so uh we've got kind of a little bit of stuff oh my god may is so busy it really is. And then, of course, the summer right around the corner. So we're going to talk a little bit about the summer lineup out there of, uh, you know, the um, not just the mountain towns, but some of the you know places that are doing repertory or, you know, have a specific summer uh, programming. 
thing. And uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, you know more more of what's coming up in May. And also, uh, there's a uh, the Boulder Ensemble Theater Company has kind of a mini play festival over the next uh, mm-hmm. uh, month or so. So we'll talk about that. Um, so super super busy. It uh, seems like for this time of year with a lot of new shows uh, and even some premieres. So I saw I was at uh, the Denver Savoy last night for local theaters. Uh, world premiere of 237 Virginia Avenue. Uh, so this is a, a play by David Myers that uh, stars, uh, and we had them on the pod last week, uh, the think- actors Lawrence Hecht and, and Jacob Dresch, who were both just absolutely, oh my God. It's a good play. It's a really good play. It's not as funny as I thought it might be because they kind of bill it as a dark mm-hmm. comedy, but it's probably, it's really more of a drama with a few laughs in it, but it's uh, it's yeah. really, really well done. So you've seen it? I- I've read the script. I okay. I'm- uh, before my interview with the creative team, including uh, the writer David Myers, I was like, I kind of need to read this script because it was kind of a lot to get my head around. I was like, these ha- they're actors, they're playing people throughout different time periods. What is the tone? What's the feel? So I was definitely glad that I read it. But yeah, it's uh, it billed as a dark comedy, but I do think it's potentially that's not the most... That's not maybe the most truthful marketing of the actual play itself, because it's it's really a biting critique of the housing market. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's a really interesting, uh, really well constructed play, and it's just it's hard to overstate how good these two actors are in these roles. Uh, so don't miss that if you can. Uh, and it's, it's yeah, it's just great. Probably probably my favorite, uh, maybe my favorite, of, uh, you know, new plays uh, of the season so far. So. So, uh, also, uh, so you were out at, um, vintage last night. So you saw the 25th annual Putnam County spelling bee. I did see that. I was, I, I was out there uh, opening night of this musical. It, it was my first time actually seeing it, the adult version live. I've seen, uh, there's high school versions of Putnam County spelling bee for some reason. I, which doesn't make a ton of sense to me because you have to change so much. <laughs> so this is my first time seeing it proper. And I was directed by uh, Carter Carter Edward Smith, I think. Am I can oh, let me double check that. Out. That's right. That's right. Okay. It's uh, it's directed by Carter Edward Smith, who this is his first time uh, directing, and and he really does a remarkable job. He's just done. Uh, he's assembled a really incredible cast over there, uh, and there was actually even a swing on uh, last night in one of the main roles playing Leaf. Uh, as well as a couple of other various roles uh, throughout the show. And m- he just did a remarkable job. It's it's really, I think, a testament to the quality of the direction of the overall production when you can have a swing step in like that and the show works so well. Everybody's clearly so comfortable and they trust each other. So it was a, it was a really special opening night to be at. All right. That sounds great. Yeah, Vintage is always, always uh, doing good shows. And they... Uh... They just came out with their new season uh, lineup, so um, I, we can talk about that uh, maybe next week. But uh, uh, they've got a pretty cool, uh, cool season coming up. So, um, mm-hmm. speaking of local theaters, so uh, Betsy, the Boulder Ensemble Theater Company, has a new play festival coming up. So it's over. Uh, so it starts on this Monday, May sixth. So uh, it would be last night if you're listening to this. I'm going to put it out on the seventh. Um, and then on May 13th, uh, they have a show uh, by Sam Collier uh, called The Light That's Left Me. That'll be at the Dairy in Boulder. And then on May 20th, Hellfire and Ham, which I love the title there, by Colette Mazunik. And that's at the Dairy. And then it ends out on Tuesday, May 28th with Long Live Rock by uh, Josh Hartwell, well-known uh, playwright here in mm-hmm. uh, Colorado. And that's, uh, that'll be at Miner's Alley. And uh, it's, it's funny. It's, it's about it's about a... Uh, so someone with a passion for midnight oil, which is kind of funny just because it's a, I would say largely forgotten band from the eighties, but it was pretty good. So I, I think, you know, a little bit more about this than I do though. What, have you talked to, uh, have you talked to the folks there, Betsy, about this? I, I have. So this is the kind of the result of the writers group that they have. The writers group is a, a group of Colorado based playwrights uh, that came together starting in 2018 to kind of hold each other accountable Uh, be writing partners for one another, share pages. And then at the end, uh, after their work, they start in August. And then at the end of their kind of work together each May, they do a little showcase called the Plays Plays with Fire Festival. Uh, And so this is their biggest group yet. They have eight short playwriters, three full-length playwriters, and three theater for young adult writers. Uh, And then the theater for young adults, 
plays, those were done privately at schools and for children, whereas the full-length plays and these short plays are being done in these public readings that anybody can come and attend, they're free, and they're just a really uh, good opportunity to see Colorado writers uh, in Colorado and hear what they're working on. That's great. Yeah. I mean, you can never have too many uh, opportunities for new new works to be out there. So that's cool if Betsy's uh, joined the join the list of theater companies that do something uh, at one point in the year. So uh, so that sounds yeah. great. It was interesting because in my research for the for the piece itself, I kind of was looking into the history of a couple of the other new play festivals around Colorado, like the Colorado New Play Summit at the Denver Center or the Durango Play Fest. Uh, and what I kind of found was interesting is although they're here in Colorado, they often the majority of the writers whose shows that they produce uh, in the festivals are actually from out of state. And so I thought it was pretty interesting that Betsy has a whole new play festival that's specifically based to Colorado playwrights here in Colorado. Yep. Awesome. So, all right. Well, that's coming up. And then uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, I was looking at our calendar for a lot of times if I'm trying to gauge the busyness, I'll look at the next Saturday because, you know, there's, you know, the most shows are maybe on Friday and Saturday. And so we had uh, for this coming Saturday, more than 50 shows uh, listed on on Saturday alone, which is quite a quite a few. Uh, it's, it's usually only like around Christmas time that you have more than that. So uh, what, what are some of the highlights uh, for you that, in the month ahead that you're looking forward to? So there's so much good stuff uh, to choose from. But I, I think some of the highlights for me is I, I'm definitely looking I am looking forward to attending Betsy's new play, Festival Plays with Fire, which we just discussed. I'm going to be at all four of those readings. And I think that's going to be really just really cool event to attend. I'm looking forward to it's a play music event called Whiskey from Strangers, right. which is by uh, Grapefruit Lab. Uh, and it's a co- it's a collaboration between them and this local Denver band called Teacup Gorilla. And it's an album release slash live performance. Uh, I was just talking with the team yesterday and they described it as Pert Theater, Pert uh, Interactive Concert. So I, it's going to be over in Buntport Space. This is a really cool, creative team. They've done a lot of collaborations together. Uh, and so they always do really interesting stuff. So that's d- definitely one that's on my list. Yeah, some of the things I'm looking forward to are the Lehman Trilogy uh, at the Denver Center. Uh, and also uh, Waiting for Godot, which I haven't mm-hmm. seen in quite a while. It's uh, It's been a while. And uh, Bob Blue is doing that up in Fort Collins. And I don't know if you know Bob Blue. That's where they started. That was, uh, you know, um, Wendy Ishii's thing was was kind of like the French existentialist playwrights and, and uh, really producing, you know, she was really really unusual back in the nineties that all of a sudden there was this little theater producing, you know, things like waiting for Godot and, uh, but other, other similar type plays. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to making the trek up to Fort Collins to see that. Uh, another one is impossible things, uh, that the catamounts are doing. This mm-hmm. is an immersive, an immersive thing. And I think you know a little bit more about that as well. Don't you? I do. So I just was chatting with the creative team earlier this week. Uh, it includes the Catamounts, the theater group, immersive theater group based out of Boulder, which you just mentioned. And it's a collaboration between them and Lonnie Hansen's Hansen Studio. He's a right. very well-known uh, design, visual arts designer uh, who is also quite active within the uh, burgeoning immersive scene that's here in Denver. And so this piece is set at a graduation that then kind of descends into otherworldly shenanigans. <laughs> that sounds great. Uh, so yeah, Lonnie Hanson, best known for uh, Camp Christmas, uh, Denver Center Off Center, but uh, yeah, he's he's a really creative dynamo. So, and this is going to this is actually uh, it's in Denver at Fiddler's Green in the outdoor space that's over there. So it's in a really unique setting. It's built around his kind of cabinet of curiosities that's in the park over there which I've actually never been to in uh, going for the actual piece itself was my first time uh, that I got to see it. So it's cool. Oh, cool. Yeah. Me neither. Wow. So finally a show that's kind of near me down here in the South part of Denver. So. I know you, 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 you're looking out on this one. It's me. Who's going to be doing a, who's doing the drive. Have you ever <laughs> been to uh, fiddler's green? I've not been to Fiddler's Green. I've got my t- I've got tickets for my first show in September. I'm going to the Casey Musgraves concert. Uh, there uh-huh. but okay. i i've not been myself i've got i've got myself some uh, i know that people said i should have i should splurge and get the seated uh, tickets at fiddler's green but it was just too expensive so i'm a, i'm on the lawn seating which 
I heard could be could be dicey, but on, on our risk. Yeah, the lot's not bad. It's not a huge venue, so it's you know the lot's not bad as long as it doesn't you know rain or something. But Little Screen's interesting. It opened in the '90s. It's kind of plopped right in the middle of this kind of residentially office park area in Greenwood Village. Uh, and when they first opened, man, they had every. I saw REM there. I think I saw Rod Stewart there back in the day. I mean, they had a lot of big bands come through, and then they. They, they went through a weird period where they, at one point they, they were renamed the Comfort Dental Amphitheater, which was kind of like the laughing stock of like, you know, uh, sort of the corporate renamed uh, venues. Uh, and then they, they went back to Fiddler's Green and, and, uh, and it seems, and then they were, they seemed like they were kind of dormant for a while, but they're, they're starting to, to schedule some more stuff in there. So that's, that's cool. The only thing, Fiddler's Green is a real challenged park uh, there. So it's a good place to go like with an Uber or something if you can. That is what I've heard. I am planning on taking the the tr- the train or the public transit options in there. So I, yeah, I, yeah, I just heard the train there trying to get in and out. Yeah, yeah. I think the last time I went there uh, was uh, last summer. So we used her there, and I think we paid so twenty or twenty five uh-huh. bucks to park in some place. So yeah, they ding you. So anyway, well, cool. Well, I want to look uh, at the summer the summer season coming up. So of course all the theaters are doing shows in the summer, but there's some particular theaters that, that either only do shows in the summer or they have a particular program coming up. So, and some of them are really kind of, you know, pretty storied, uh, you know, theater organizations that have been doing it for a while. So, uh, kicking things off, you know, talk about uh, little theater of the Rockies. So this is, uh, at UNC up in Greeley. It's the, uh, they call themselves the oldest professional summer stock West of the Mississippi. Uh, and they're doing so a lot of these are they're not doing like groundbreaking shows, but they're doing crowd pleasers, you know, and, and uh, so they're doing Almost Heaven, which is the John Denver thing, uh, Every Brilliant Thing, and then The Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder this summer. Um, and uh, we had uh, uh, Megan Van de Hey on the podcast last year uh, talking about the, the, the program. Uh, then I'll, I'll add a link to that interview because uh, it's interesting, you know, talking about uh, how it all started and things like that. So. Uh, and then uh, there's the Rocky Mountain Repertory uh, Theater in Grand Lake, which is, you know, up in the mountains, uh, more or less. It started way back in 1966. So this summer they're doing Kinky Boots, The Music Man, Come From Away, and I Left My, my, left my Heart, which is a Tony Bennett thing. Uh, have you ever been uh, up there, Tony? Are you going to try and get up there at all? I have not been myself. I am going to try to get up there this year because I'm working on a big piece uh, with all of these companies. Uh, about kind of how summer theater festivals work. And so I'm going to be doing my best to kind of get up there so I can kind of get a sense of the actual operations on the ground oh, for great. some of these places that I haven't been to. Like Little Theater of the Rockies, I haven't been to, but that's on my list, uh, as well as Rocky Mountain Repertory and a couple of these others that we're about to get uh-huh. into. Yeah, it's challenging. I mean, you're 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 really catering to a lot of the tourists coming through. I mean, I'm sure you know some locals, but a lot of a lot of tourists that they're you know, which is why they're doing familiar titles that that, that people will will, uh, will be kind of more comfortable going to see maybe. So, uh, Theater Silco, originally the Lake Dillon Theater Company, so they uh, they, they went all pro. Uh, so they're an equity theater, uh, and so they have a year round lineup. Uh, but they do kind of a summer rep season, uh, you know, where they have uh, they they have act- bring in actors from from around the the country and so they're doing uh ken ludwig's moriarty the amish project the legend of georgia mcbride and plus they have some improv things a jazz series they've got all kinds of kids classes going on all summer so that's a really busy 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 place along the blue river in silverthorne uh all summer long and then uh the big one uh i guess uh, creed repertory theater uh which just also started in 1966 so uh we've we've done some some uh pieces on them in the past on the pod so this year they are doing baskerville young frankenstein the importance of being earnest prima's guide to funerals and plus they've got a, a regular in- improv series called boomtown they've got a new festival new play festival called headwaters they've got all kinds of kid stuff going on and uh and and then you know as we've we've mentioned before creed is a is an interesting town it's way down south in colorado like great kind of uh, almost in like in a box canyon. It's like I think in the winter time there might be five hundred people there, and and the, the Creed the theater is the town in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Creed is like one of those theaters that's really captured the attention of the national press too. Like every yeah. year you'll see a couple of pieces about it or whatnot because it's like, oh, isn't it interesting that this whole town is based around theater? Yeah, yeah, it's a theater nerd's uh, dream come true kind of town. So, a mm-hmm. uh, little more well-known 
town in Colorado, Aspen, has Theater Aspen. And so they uh, they have a, a tent called the Hearst Theater. So it's it's not completely outside or inside. So, you know, you kind of have to dress for the, the weather. Uh, but they're doing Steel Magnolias, Legally Blonde, and Come From Away this summer. Uh, if you can get up to Aspen. And it's an expensive place to stay, needless to say. Uh, but you can, you know, you can try and stay in you know, Carbondale or, or even Glenwood or something. Uh, but if you haven't been to Aspen, and a lot of Coloradans haven't been, it's such a neat town to visit. It really is. It's a beautiful, beautiful little town. And, uh, you know, it's fun to just walk around and say, wow, that modest looking house is worth $5 million <laughs> and things like that. So uh, speaking of uh, fancy towns in Colorado, Telluride Theater, uh, they, they always they usually do a Shakespeare show in the summer. They're doing Twelfth Night uh, this year. I think it's uh, it'll, it'll be in July. Uh, and then uh, closer to uh, the Front Range here, and this is a program you know a little bit more about than I do because I've never been. Arts in the Open in Boulder, so they're at the Chautauqua, and they're uh, doing Alice in Wonderland and another one called Wicked Wandering. So can you tell us a little bit more about Arts in the Open? Absolutely. So they're going to build as a immersive theater of sorts uh, because they block these plays alongside the mountains. Uh, so you are actually hiking up and the story is unfolding at various points along your hike. Uh, and so it's kind of geared around the themes of Leave No Trace uh, as well. And so it's very environmental focused, getting people outdoors and kind of doing these uh, sh- these more family friendly shows that are inspired to get people active. That's great. Yeah, that, that just sounds like a neat program. I need, I need to get out there. It's been it's been too long. <laughs> it's my... fun. I I've been to a co- I've been to two of their their shows, and each hike is very different. I I've been to their both of their Halloween two of their Halloween shows for the last two years. Their Frankenstein, and then their I think it's called How to Be a Zombie or something. The uh-huh. guide to being a zombie. Uh, very th- that one was very funny whereas the frankenstein was much more serious i'm not very effective actually uh-huh. out, out in the wild <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that's that's great and, and what what are the what are like a on on one of those shows about how many people do they have along on the hike so each time i have been it's been about 20 to 25 people who are who are actually hiking along the trail Okay, and is it a fairly mellow hike? I'm assuming you're not scaling, you know, Devil's Peak or anything. You're, yeah, definitely, it's, <laughs> you're you're not hiking anything that intense. But it is about a, a mile and a half to two miles uh, of hiking, and so you do you do have to be able to do that distance. It is a slight uh, incline as well, so on the way up, at least, it's a little bit more challenging but i would say that if you if you have any experience in colorado hiking it is it's not a particularly grueling walk uh-huh. okay uh and then heading back up to the mountains uh this is a a big uh thing that happens every year in vale the vale dance festival so for uh, for i mean this is this is like a real destination thing for for you know fans of of dance so that's uh, in july i guess most of the shows are in the outdoor Ford Amphitheater, which is a, a beautiful facility. Uh, and then they have, I think they do uh, one or two in the Villar Center, which is also another really nice, uh, beautiful theater they built there indoors. Uh, and they're doing an, uh, something this year in Avon at the Avon Building, which is also outside. And so Alice Caterlin, who uh, writes for us, is also re- very well, she's very familiar with this dance festival. She's going to be doing a uh, review of that coming up. So we'll have that on the website if you want to learn more about what the lineup is uh, this summer. So uh, so that is not everything that's going on, you know, uh, this summer by any means. We're just trying to hit some of the big ones. Did I did I miss anything that uh, you can think of, Tony? Uh, I guess, yeah, the Colorado Shakespeare Festival oh, is course, going yeah. on as well uh, over in Boulder. Although people who have been to it in the past, it, it, it may not look exactly as you remember it. Yeah, a little downsize this here. That's right. Yeah, they're only doing two main stage productions this year. They're doing Macbeth, which opens uh, June 8th, and then they're doing The Merry Wives of Windsor, which opens July 6th, and then one original practice, which is The Ardens of Favorshan, uh, July 28th. But yeah, they are significantly uh, scaled down this season because they are doing uh, renovations to the Mary Ripon Outdoor Amphitheater. So yeah. unfortunately, that beautiful space is closed off this summer. So uh, it's a little it's not quite Shakespeare in the park if it's indoors. Uh, yeah. But it's I, they always the Shakespeare festivals, they always do a really good job. And so I'm sure even though it'll be inside there, 
they're going to rise to the challenge and produce some interesting works over there. And right. The other thing I wanted to just shout out is, uh, is I uh, Red Rocks. Uh, they've all they've obviously oh, they've yeah. got a whole bunch of they've got a whole bunch of concerts and things over there. But I specifically wanted to zone in on the their collaboration with Denver Film, the film on the rocks. Right. Have you ever been to one of these before? I haven't, but I've I've thought about going. <laughs> I am so tempted, particularly with this year's lineup. They're do they're showing The Matrix, Shrek, The Wizard of Oz, Deadpool, and Mad Max Fury Road. And while I could take or leave The Wizard of Oz, the the other ones I'm like, I think that would be really cool to see outdoors in that space. Uh and actually just went to Red Rocks for the first time earlier this week to check out Trevor Noah uh, set over there. And so now that I've got a sense of the actual scope of the venue, I'm like, oh my god, this would be perfect to watch a movie in. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd be really curious to hear what your thought is on it because I think some people would be like, what? I got to go up to Red Rocks and you know the, the hassle of getting up to Red Rocks and pay 25 bucks to see an old movie that I've seen before. Uh, but of course, being at Red Rocks for anything is super cool, uh, and uh, it may well be worth it. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Although I, I was like, I could definitely see that it is you. You do have to work for Red Rocks. I didn't. I didn't realize that. Nobody warned me that <laughs> yeah. you it's a hike. <laughs> that it's a hike. It's a, it's a literal hike. I was like, oh my god, why am I parked so far away from the venue? How am I going to get over there? Yeah. And I was like, wait a second. Everybody just seems to be walking. Yeah. Wait a second. There's just a flight of stairs straight up to the top. Yep. Oh my god. Yep. Yeah, and they do have shuttle buses for for those who for sure need them or want them. But yeah, most people just kind of bitch and moan and and hike up there as they go. That was definitely my move. I was like, <laughs> it's like, when am I going to get there? So yeah, it's part of one of the one of the glories of Red Rock. So, uh, but yeah, watching movies outside is kind of interesting. Uh, it's not you know it's not something uh, we normally do. I remember a long time ago when I lived in New York City, they used to have a thing called. Uh, the floating cinema and we would go to like riverside park mm-hmm. and they would have this this like uh i don't know like a barge of some sort on the hudson and we'd be watching movies there but it really wasn't the greatest idea because the thing would just be like you know bouncing and you know moving around and stuff i don't know if they continued it but uh you know so it's, it's always novel to to see things in a, in a different venue like that so All right, well, we're going to take a quick break, and we come back, we'll take a look around the state at all of the live theater coming up. There's a ton of it, as we said, uh, as well as my interview with Lauren Hance from the What the Fringe podcast. So stick around. We'll be right back. Onstage Colorado was supported by the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center at Colorado College, whose production of Rent plays May 2nd through June 2nd at the Main Stage Theater. Jonathan Larson's Rent follows a year in the life of a group of impoverished young artists and musicians struggling to survive and create in New York's Lower East Side under the shadow of HIV-AIDS. Tickets at fac.coloradocollege.edu. The Onstage Colorado podcast is also sponsored by Town Hall Arts Center, whose production of The Prom opens May 24th. Big city stars set themselves on a collision course with small-town PTA politicians in this sequin-covered musical comedy. When a courageous young woman wants to take her girlfriend to the dance, conservative faculty members and self-righteous parents try to stand in their way. Enter the quirky Broadway quartet to the rescue, inviting the students to be the kickball change they want to see in the world. Get tickets? Townhallartcenter.org. Onstage Colorado is also supported by the Boulder Ensemble Theater Company, Betsy, with the next showing of the children's improv company Mad Librarians at the Dairy Arts Center in Boulder May 11th and 18th. Plus, the adult improv King Penny Golden Radio Show returns on May 15th, also at the Dairy. Tickets at Betsy.org. And we also receive support from Upstart Moves Theater in Ure, whose new production of Good People opens May 31st. The action takes place in Southie, the Boston neighborhood where this month's paycheck covers last month's bills. Margie has just been fired. Again, can an old boyfriend maybe offer some hope? And it's an uproarious look at the bingo game of life. Tickets and info at upstartmoves.org. All right, welcome to the Onstage Colorado podcast. I'm Alex Miller. And I'm Tony Tresca. And it's time for our regular trip around the state to see what's on stage now and what's coming up soon. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we had uh, a ton of new reviews on the site. I think we had like seven or eight new reviews in the past week because there was so much going on. Uh, so we have a um, Judith Sears reviewed Othello at the Ent Center in Colorado Springs, which she thought was really inter- uh, interesting and a really different take uh, on it. Uh, and it runs uh, through May 19th uh, there at the Ent Center. 
Uh, we were talking about space conflicts. So we talked about uh, this last week some, but that's still going on at Audacious at different breweries through May 11th. I think it might be tough to find tickets, but uh, worth it, worth a try. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Very silly show with beer. Um, so I saw Road to Lethe. Uh, this is uh, Jeffrey Newman's uh, new play um, that uh, is playing at Benchmark and that runs through May 18th. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time on this review because it was a it's a complicated uh, script, uh, and I, I'm not sure everything quite fit together uh, as mm-hmm. as much as I in terms of just kind of understanding what the playwright's ideas were. But uh, it's, it's got a great cast, uh, you know, and well staged as benchmark as things always are. Have you seen Road to Lethe yet, Tony? I, I have not seen it, but I, you're not alone in that sentiment. I, I've heard. I've heard a couple of from a couple of folks who have also seen it that it's a little bit it kind of went over their head a little bit. It's a lot of different ideas at play that sometimes seem and this is I'm quoting from someone who I was talking to in competition with themselves. And from reading the review, it kind of sounded like maybe that was kind of some of how you were feeling as well. Uh huh. Yeah. Although I will say, uh, Jeffrey Newman, the playwright, did uh, he chimed in on Facebook and, and thanked me for the thoughtful review. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's I always like it when I've you know when I'm a little more critical of something that. Uh, Adults can be like appreciative that you took the time to think through it uh, that much, and not just be like mad because you know that's part of the deal when you put stuff out in public. You gotta sometimes uh, hear hear some things that may not be as as fun. <laughs> so, uh, but still, still a cool show. Uh, on the other kind of uh, side of the spectrum, the Full Monty, ever popular musical about guys stripping for money and also therapy uh, a little bit, and that's at Miner's Alley through June second. Uh, Secret Garden is up at Candlelight, and that runs into June as well. So that's, uh, you know, Candlelight's always doing uh, banger productions up there with, uh, with a pretty decent uh, meal along the way. So Carrie, our reviewer, really liked their production up there. Uh, and then uh, Rent is uh, at the Colorado Springs Fine Art Center at Colorado College uh, through June 2nd. And we will have a review of that from our reviewer, April. And I guess if you miss Rent uh, in Colorado Springs, uh, you can catch it up here in Lafayette at the Arts Hub yeah. when it opens that following weekend. Yep. So yep. Lots of rent. Yeah, lots of rents. There's uh... Rent is always due, I suppose. That's right. Well, in a, in a state where you can't afford to buy a house, you got to think about uh, renting. So it's an appropriate show, I guess. Um, but yeah, it seems to be coming around a lot lately. Uh, we talked about 237 Virginia Avenue, uh, Sam and Delilah. So this is at Wonderbound. The show is really sold out. So unfortunately, uh, you know, probably won't be able to get in. It runs through May 12th. But uh, I just got the review from Alice Caterlin. She just loved it. I mean, we were there. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, we really, we really dug it as well. It's got amazing music by Clay Rose. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, the one thing that Alice did uh, call out in her review was that it's almost in some ways too much of a good thing because the dance is amazing. And so is the music that's being performed live by this amazingly like, crack band that Clay Rose uh, put together. And so you found your, your attention a little split uh, because the music was, you know, such a big part of it. I could definitely see that. I think that, I don't know. I, I thought that the music and having the two voices, because uh, there's two singers that are kind of voicing both Sam and Delilah as kind of inner monologues through these so- this songscape. I-, I actually thought that was a really interesting choice. I had not ever, it, a lot of the shows that I had seen in the past at Wonderbound, if they did feature live singers, just one person kind of acting as like an omniscient narrator uh-huh. over the whole thing. So I actually really liked that kind of interplay and back and forth. But, you know, I guess that's why we, different people go to, di- go to the shows uh, and have, and, that's what's fun about having different critics voices there. Absolutely. You can have a different reaction. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fantastic show and that closes out their season. Mm-hmm. So they will, they'll be back at the end of August, I think with their next, uh, their next uh, season. So uh, and they, they also just announced uh, their next season upcoming, which is a pretty, a pretty good banger of four shows. They're doing devil's crush, jolly moxie with the Colorado jazz repertory orchestra, Garrett Amon's agent Romeo, and then Space Cowboy. Where did we sit on the bus? Is playing at the Denver Center, at the Denver Center Theater Company. Our reviewer, Julie Walker, will be at that one. That runs through June 2nd. Uh, you were talking about the Putnam County Spelling Bee. Uh, Eric Fitzgerald mm-hmm. had a review of that. Uh, it sounds like a, a great show. And that runs through June 9th. Uh, the aforementioned Lehman Trilogy at the Denver Center that I'll be at uh, runs uh, just open this weekend. And it runs through June 2nd. Down in Durango, Merely Players are doing Chicago through uh, May 19th. 
And then the Lincoln Center, one for the kids, James and the Giant Peach through May 18th. Uh, and that's one for the kids by the kids, actually. That's a debut theater. And so this is a, a troop of theater uh, students who up, the, up in Fort Collins who they market the show themselves. They produce it. They build all the scenery. They're stage managing. And they're kind of it's so it's all their vision, which is a really cool concept as well. Yeah, yeah, it's re- it's really neat uh, the way they do that, and it's not just like it's not a kids show where like you know the little ones no. are looking to see you know and they're they're forgetting their lines and things like that. I think these kids are are pretty dialed, <laughs> so uh, they, they really are. I've been up there. I've been up to see a couple of their productions, and I was just so floored by the professionalism yeah. that these performers exhibit. At just all around because they're also the ones greeting you into the theater and helping you find your seat and everything and you're just like dang these are little stars yeah yeah it's always it's fascinating to see like you know even if you just go to a regular little kids show at their school to see you know uh, of if maybe there's 20 kids there's there's maybe you know three or four that you can see like the, yeah they're gonna go on yeah, they're loving this okay. so much they are looking they're looking for the warmth of the spotlight on their face at all times so uh, so, uh, Jess Rob Lee will be back with uh, what the Constitution means to me uh, at the dairy from uh, Betsy that'll uh, that runs through May nineteenth. So, kind of a, a second leg of that show. And I know re- I reported on the podcast last week that that is sold out. But yep. if you did, if you were dragging your feet on that, uh, luckily Betsy has made accommodations for you, and they've worked with the Dairy Center to add a performance. So there is yeah. one additional performance that you can purchase tickets to, although I do fear that by the time I am saying this, those tickets may already <laughs> be gone because demand is so high for this show. Yep. Yep. Um, and then uh, Platte Valley Players in Brighton uh, is doing Midsummer Night's Dream through May 11th. And then uh, at Cherry Creek Theater, they're doing Heartbeat of the Sun. Uh, Eric Fischer will be at that. This is a, a buddy comedy uh, running May uh, through May 19th. You know, and... Uh, I, I didn't realize that Suzy Snodgrass had left uh, Cherry Creek. I got an email from, I guess, there's a temporary artistic director. So uh, I'm not sure where she went. So uh, wherever you are, Suzy, I hope all is well and that uh, you're happy wherever you wherever you landed. So um, also uh, on stage coming soon, uh, a bunch more shows. And I was just going to remind people to remember Mother's Day on May 12th. Maybe, uh, you know, a nice Mother's Day gift would be to take mom out for a, a matinee or even the night before, whatever. Uh, this first one is not in that category. It's Louie's Big Play <laughs> at the Buell, May 11th and 12th for the little ones. Uh, that's a, I've never seen this because my kids are older now, and uh, I don't think my grandkids watch Louie's. But anyway, it's, it's a very popular kids' TV show. Mm-hmm. Uh, stories on stage also for the kids. Storybooks on stage, May 11th at the Dairy. And then uh, Mad Librarians at uh, Betsy will be uh, back on May 11th and 18th at the Dairy. And then Milibo, uh Milibos uh, down in Colorado Springs is doing their Incredible Circus through May 11th. Uh, Upstart Crow is doing Hair at the Wind through the 19th at Darien Boulder. Colt Creek Theater is doing Shadowlands uh, May 3rd through 18th. The Savannah Springs Sipping, uh, Savannah Sipping Society Impossible Players in Pueblo through May 24th. Uh, Cleo Parker Robinson has a, a dance show called Legacy May 10th through 12th. And then Ken- I, I- actually met Cleo Parker Robinson for the first time uh, oh, yeah. this week. She was at Wonderbound's show, Dance Worlds Collide. Ah, you should introduce me. I've never met her either. <laughs> uh, she, I, Lisa Kennedy, uh, the freelance writer for the Denver Post, she introduced me. I had to know who she, I had no idea who she was. We were just all talking together. And Lisa was like, oh, Tony, do you know who this is? And I was like, I, no, no, Lisa, I cannot say that I do. And she was like, oh, well, you let me make the introduction. <laughs> you know, I was watching, I was, when I was at, uh, at the Savoy last night for, uh, 237 Virginia Avenue, Lisa was across the aisle from me and I, and she's <laughs> one of these, uh, she's a, she's a fantastic theater writer and she, but she takes notes and I, I, I think you do too. And it's like something I've always kind of, I do. I can't do it. I can't, like, if I start taking notes, I can't pay attention. I, I'm afraid I'll miss something on stage and, and, uh. Uh, and I have when I've tried it, and I'm like, I just, I just, uh, I don't do it. But so she apparently works for her, it works for you, but teaches out. I, I couldn't. I don't know. I, I think that there. I enjoy being able to write down quick little things because I don't know. There's so, as I'm watching a show, sometimes I can kind of, you can kind of 
know what you're going to write about. You want to remember certain things or there are certain performances and elements that you want to be sure to highlight. So I appreciate having that there. Although I could definitely see maybe why it might, it could be distracting. Yeah, I know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm bad. I should do it, but I don't know. I've been doing, I've been writing theater reviews for 30 plus years now. So I don't know. You don't feel like I've. Hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> it's right. their own. Uh, also coming up, so, you know, Wallace Shawn, who many people know as the, uh, uh, from The Princess Bride, you know, he was the- Inconceivable. Uh, that guy, yeah. And, but also uh, pretty, you know, a playwright in his own right. But I, you know, can't think of any uh, of his plays being staged here in recent memory. So Counterweight Theater Lab is doing his play, The Fever, at uh, the Boucher Art and Stage in Colorado Springs. So uh, May 11th through 25th, I don't know much about that, but uh, yeah, see Wallace Shawn represented here. Crested Butte Mountain Theater is doing every brilliant thing through May 19th. And then the Westcliff players are working with uh, the lo- local high school up there uh, in Westcliff, the Custer High School, and doing Treasure Island. So kind of a combo thing with the adults and the kids uh, through May 12th. That'd probably be fun. And then uh, Longmont Theater Company is doing Fiddle on the Roof, May 10th through 25th. Uh, out in Montrose, they're doing Something Rotten, May 10th through June 1st, which I still haven't ever seen and I want to very badly. Uh, uh, Legacy You're of, missing out. It's such a good show. Oh, Alex. I know, I know, and it's I don't know. It's, it's it gets produced plenty. I don't know why I haven't gotten to it. But I will. Uh, third side players are going to be performing the Legacy of Baker Street at Evergreen Players Black Black Box Theater May 10th through 19th, and I think you're going to be at uh, one of those, right? I will. I'll be there on uh, next Sunday for to review that production. This is the first outing from Third Side Players uh, over there, so. I'm looking forward to it. Legacy of Baker Street is also written by a Colorado-based playwright. So exciting to see a new troupe supporting Colorado writers. Yeah, great. And it's a, it's a great little black box theater where they serve cookies and things like that. Uh, uh, so, I have to grab me a cookie. That's right, yeah. Uh, Whiskey from Strangers, which you mentioned uh, from Grape, Grapefruit Lab. They'll be at Bunt Port uh, through, uh, May 10th through June 1st. Uh, and then uh, that was the end of my list, Tony. I'm sure you've got some things uh, to add. I'll just quickly shout out one that I am I'm also personally excited about. I should have mentioned this earlier when we were talking about things we were looking forward to in May, but it's a I don't normally shout out touring productions that come through the Denver Center, but I am I am unapologetically excited about the touring production of Company coming through. Uh-huh. And I know you don't like Company, <laughs> but I love Company. Company is it's it's between that and Merrily We Roll Along for my favorite Sondheim musical and this is a gender swapped revival with Brittany Coleman at the helm. And I have been following Brittany Coleman's career since she was in Team Star Kid, which is an wow. online theater uh, troupe who does like they did parodies. And she was in a very Potter musical uh, parody years ago. And so it's, incre- it's incredible to see that she's now at the helm of this first national tour of company. So uh, I'm interviewing her for westward and i'm so excited to see her on tour uh, at company when she comes through the denver center wonderful yeah and i, I should say that i saw a production of company that i didn't like a long time ago it doesn't mean that there aren't <laughs> very good productions of that play and, and lots of people have low sign time so all right well uh hold on and uh we'll get to my interview with lauren hance from what the fringe podcast to talk about uh, her pod uh, the fringe the fringe world and also her own show coming up at the denver fringe so hold on we'll be right back with lauren hance All right, we're here with Lauren Hans. Uh, very excited to have another podcaster on the podcast. So thanks for being on the Onstage Colorado podcast. Lauren, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, where are you uh, calling in from? I'm from Houston, Texas, but I was actually born in Colorado Springs. So Ooh, all right. native Colorado right here. My dad was in the Air Force and we lived there for a while. So I love, okay. love Colorado. Great. Well, you'll be here in June for the Denver Fringe Festival. And so uh, one of the you uh, you have a, a podcast called What the Fringe, which is all about fringe festivals. And you're also a fringe performer. So we'll get into that. Um, and so you'd reached out to me and said, hey, I'm going to be, you know, let's talk. Let's talk fringe. And so uh, I think, you know, it's a really valuable uh, podcast. I listened to your latest episode, which was a lot of fun. You were talking to another you know, a solo artist performer. Uh, who performs at Fringe, and her name was Megan, I think? 
Yeah, Megan Phillips. Okay, yeah, it was a it was a great conversation. You're a great interviewer. It was a very funny, uh, very funny, very different from mine. I don't usually cry on my own, on my podcast, so it was, it was fun listening to the two of you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Megan. Is she is so much fun. She's a, a Canadian uh, actress, and so she does a lot of solo theater and she coaches people. She's a really cool chick. She was she was a lot of fun to have on. <laughs> we had a good uh-huh. time. <laughs> it's funny. I was I, when I looked at your your. Your initial email, I thought it said uh, you you uh, covered all things French theater, and so I was listening to the podcast, and I'm like, man, these neither of these women sound like they're French, although the ones from Canada. So anyway, I was I always I was, have to <laughs> I always have to use my like articulation when I talk to people. I'm like, it's French theater, and everybody everybody is they go French, and I'm like, no, like the weird stuff or like the the, the thing you find at the bottom of your dress, French. <laughs> right, right. Well, um. Let me just ask you for so a lot of people don't really understand the Fridge Festival if they haven't been to one. Uh, what is you? What is your like kind of elevator statement when people ask you like, well, what's a what do I see at a Fringe Festival? What is it? Fringe is a great way to support artists to get exposed to different types of theater. I also try to tell people like, think of the weirdest. Thing you can think of in performing arts, and you'll probably find it at a fringe festival. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of new work, and there's a lot of really good work, really hardworking artists who come to fringe festivals just to have a platform to perform. Because, as you know, in the theater industry, so much is driven by ticket sales and boards and things that we have to do to keep a theater alive, and it's hard to produce a lot of new work. And fringe festivals are a place where new work can start and can breathe and introduce audiences to genres that they never even knew that they loved. Right, right, yeah, and it's a great format for like short, really sh- maybe maybe short pieces uh, that wouldn't you know you're not gonna you're not gonna mount a production of some twenty minute you know solo show, but fringe festival is a great venue to do it and. If you're really, uh, if you've really got a nice piece, you, there are many French festivals, so you can kind of tour around with it. Have have how many French festivals have you performed at? I have been in four so far. I went to Solo Fest in 22, and then in 23, I did Capital Fringe, Omaha Fringe, and Vancouver. And then this year, I'm lined up to come to Denver. I'm going to Minnesota and Rochester. So I keep a kind of shorter schedule. I have a family and that's about as much as the bandwidth that I have to right. to go out. Yeah. Yeah. It's like being a musician on tour. You know, you can only do so much if you're, unless you're hauling, hauling in the big bucks doing it, which is not usually uh, the, the hallmark of a French performer. So it's, no. it's, it's for the fun of, of theater. So, uh, well, I, I want to talk about your uh, particular show in just a little bit, but I wanted to ask first about your podcast. So what the fringe uh, is, uh, you know, all things French festivals. When did you start the pod? I just started it in April. I started working on it uh, more closer to the beginning of the year and started booking guests and getting a lot of stuff in the in the queue before I actually launched the podcast because I didn't want to be one of those people that was like, I've got one episode, listen, and, yeah. and then it just dies and fizzles. That's, the, and that's so, what they say you to do. So yeah. Right. So I've got all of that. And there's not a lot of podcasts out there for fringe theater, which I was actually very surprised. Mm-hmm. There are a handful of podcasts that that cover larger festivals like Edinburgh. There's one that that does Edinburgh every year and they're there while the festival is going on interviewing people. And there's a handful of others, but there's not one that's just like general fringe. And I was really surprised by that. So I was very excited. There's quite a market, if you will, for, for the podcast and for the community. Yeah. Yeah. And fringe performers, as I, as I know, uh, they start, they've already started emailing me, uh, you know, about all their shows. Uh, and you know, it's, it's a challenge for me to, to, to cover them all, uh, because, you know, we're a volunteer organization. We have about, I don't know, maybe six or seven reviewers, uh, working for the site. Um, uh, and also, you know, we do have a calendar, but it's like staggering, um, amount of work to add them all into the calendar individually. So a lot of times I'm just going to have a blanket, um, thing in there. It's, you know, it's, it's really best to just go on the Denver, denverfridge.org and look at the calendar that they have to see uh, who's who's performing and what and it's a uh, so Ann Saba who's run who runs that has really done a great job with uh, getting getting and building this program up in just a few years and uh, having a great 
a lineup of performers and also a good website that uh, makes it easy to find things uh, on there. So uh, yeah, we're lucky to have have her uh, leading the charge here in Denver for Fringe. So She's fantastic. I've been to a couple of Fringes and it's not an easy job to manage all of the artists and all of the shows and all of the marketing, like you said. Uh, it, it's hard work and she is fantastic. They are so on top of it. Her entire team is so on top of it. This festival... I feel so comfortable. They're asking for like all of my tech stuff beforehand. They're like, we need it. Like it's due today. I have to send right. stuff in. And I was like, I've never had anybody ask me this before. It's you show up and I hope that that I can make my lights work or we'll see what you have. And they'll, they'll usually send you schematics and things like that. But he's like, I want your QLab files. I want all this. And I was like, oh my gosh, you guys are amazing. You're so put together. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> So uh, from your experience performing in Fringe and also from, uh, you know, I, I know you just started it, but you've done a few interviews talking to Fringe performers and, and I guess organizers. What have, what have you learned about this this world, this ecosystem of Fringe that uh, maybe you didn't know before or or something that's really struck you as, as who's involved in this, this these efforts? I really love hearing from artists and the way they explain their work and the way they go about their process. That has been really lovely to just talk shop with people, if you will, because, you know, you have a certain way of looking at your art and doing your art and then being able to interview other people and see their perspective and um, how, how they work is really beautiful. And sometimes it gives me words that I didn't have before or ways to express myself, uh, you know, about what I do. And I, I love that. And then the other thing is that fringe is hard. It is so incredibly hard. And in some ways, I feel like we commiserate, if you will. I think it's particularly the marketing end of fringe, especially if you're a solo performer. It's just you most of the time. You will have a team of people that kind of help develop the show, but not necessarily to market the show. Yeah. And Nobody in drama school teaches you marketing. There is not a semester course in how to market a theater, how to market a show. This is just stuff I've had to learn all on my own through books, through going to courses, through looking at stuff online and then being bombarded by marketing on social media. You know, you have to kind of filter through all the noise. But that has been really nice just to have other friends that are in the same boat. Right. For sure. It's something that, you know, I've done a couple of workshops on theater marketing uh, here in Colorado, just because, you know, yeah, there are a handful of theaters that have a, a paid professional, uh, you know, who does it, but most don't, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, Joni at the front desk, <laughs> you know, who, who uh, you know, handles the stuff. And there's just my point to anybody who's trying to do uh, this kind of marketing is that it, there's so much free stuff out there that you can tap into. It just takes some time. But once you figure out a couple of the basics on on where you need to place your information, a lot of the stuff you can you can automate it. You can you know there's platforms where you can post on multiple social sites, and a lot a lot of them have you know free versions and things like that. So if you just you just need to spend a little time educating yourself on on how to do it. And it's, yeah, it's 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 frustrating, but uh, you know it is it is doable. And then you know if you do have a couple of bucks to you know to do a Facebook post bump but you can try and see that but for a lot of it a lot of it's not that expensive so uh, so denver fringe is june 6th through 9th so it's just a little over a month away so it's great to have you on here as kind of a preview uh but i want to talk about your show holy oh so uh so this is about a woman who wants to be a nun but doesn't want to give up her vibrators is that correct yeah there you go you got it <laughs> okay so my first question was like what what nuns aren't allowed to have vibrators it seems like that would be like you know here's your bible here's your wimple here's your vibrator stay away from the priests you know uh you know, you got to have it. But but anyway, where, where does this come from? Are you a recovering Catholic? Or? No, I, I'm I'm not. My back, my religious background is Protestantism. Um, still, I'm still a Protestant. And uh, I went, I grew up during purity culture and kind of had a lot of bad information or just interpreted what people were teaching in a really unhealthy way and had a very unhealthy view of sexuality and bodies and 
what they do and how they function and how they function in relationships. And it, my husband as well grew up in that same kind of purity culture. Uh-huh. And so we just had a lot of dysfunction in our, in our marriage, if you will. And so I started kind of processing through that. And at the same time, I was, I learned about some of the Catholic saints, uh, St. Teresa of Avila in particular. And she was a mystic kind of there in the late uh, 1700s, early 1800s. And she would have these uh, prayer experiences is what I call them. She would be deep in prayer and her body would respond like physical kind of response. And I remember reading about this and hearing about it. I was like, mm, I think she's having an orgasm. <laughs> and uh, I've had friends, they're like, no, no, that's not what's happening. And I'm like, mm, not that, you know, like yeah. our bodies are designed to respond in a way when we feel loved. And so if she's feeling loved and seen and known, it would make sense that her body would respond. And so that kind of inspired the show. It, there's so many I, I probably couldn't even put all the pieces together of how it came together, but there's this woman who uh, grew up kind of Protestant, had a lot of church hurt, a lot of junk, turned atheist, and then uh, meets these Catholic nuns, moves in next door to him. She's not real happy about that, but they, they kind of win her over. And so she's like, I have to, now I have to become a nun. She's just bonkers. And so as her story unfolds, uh, we see kind of that she's she's on the edge of of um of not being okay, probably over the edge of not being okay, and and um and so it's just the exploration in her journey of that. So okay. to answer your question, like, did nuns have vibrators? I don't think so. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that I think it just you know signifies that okay, we're going to be talking about sex, we're going to be talking about bodies, we're going to be talking about uh, faith and doubt and all of those kinds of things in the show. Right. You know, it's it's interesting. It's that the whole uh, discussion about sex toys in general, vibrators used to be a punchline. And now, I mean, you'll see like wire cutter do reviews of, of these things. And I, I've actually, as I, as I noted earlier, I was, I've been looking for, for a job and, and I came across a, a, a job as an editor for some sort of sex technology site and i was like oh i gotta what what is that and it's like basically a bunch of reviews of these things and i was reading through and it's like you know of course it wouldn't make any sense to couch this in euphemisms and stuff so they just come right out and say stick it here and you turn it on and some of them have like apps that you can control (laughs) remotely and all this stuff it's wild absolutely and there's i think there's a lot there's a lot of companies out there i follow some of them on my accounts you know and um, they, they are very, uh, in some ways, very tasteful about yeah. sex in bodies. And it's a very sex positive, if you will. And some of it could be some of that knee jerk reaction of purity culture and just the, the things that, that were happening, especially like in the eighties and the nineties. And I mean, even further back than that, but, uh, you know, going like, Hey, we do have bodies and we, sex is great. And sometimes we need help and here are the things and yeah. here's what you can do. There's a lot of female owned companies out there because women's sexuality has been repressed for so long. And, and so it's really neat to, to see those, those things out there and people kind of talking openly about things that have been very private and painful for a long time. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how many uh, performances of Holy O have you done? Oh my gosh. Uh, I think I did 16 in my season last year and I probably did five or six the year before. So that's pretty decent for a fringe. Like uh, Mm -hmm. a lot of people, I mean, I'll continue. I want to do the show for a couple of years. So, Uh, but I've been working on it for four or five years now, probably from the, you know, from when I started thinking about it to writing the script to, Uh staged reading and development. So I've been working on it a long time. And so uh, I was was in the the conversation you had with Megan, she'd said that she, her magic number was 25, right? For by the time you've done your show 25 times, you probably really got it dialed in. How how, uh, accurate does that seem to you now that you're getting close to that? I'm getting close to that. And I was super excited. I was like, I'm going to be hitting that at Denver. Let's see what happens. But for me, Every season, if you will, I revisit it and get more help with acting, moving forward, developing the script more. The script has a lot of uh, 
variability in it. The audience gets to choose a lot of stories that they hear. So uh-huh. I write new content all the time and stick that in. And so it's, it's a very um, mobile kind of piece, if you will. So it's constantly uh-huh. changing. So I'm actually going to Los Angeles this week to work with someone to to keep growing it. So I'm sure 25 is a great number, but I'm like, right. I'm going to keep going past that, you know, yeah. like. <laughs> Maybe arbitrary, but, you know, yeah. it strikes me that those kinds of performances have a lot in common with a stand-up routine. Uh, where you do adjust it uh, as you go, it changes. You might make ad- adaptations for the, the particular audiences. Does that sound uh, accurate? Is, it, is there a lot of similarity there? In some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. It's like my show in particular is like traditional theater in that we have a script, and at some point, I put the kibosh on it and said, "No more adjustments to the script. This is what we have, and we now need to focus on the acting because I'm also the writer." So, so we did that, and then, kind of, when the season's over, I can go back and revisit it as a writer and then as a performer. So the adjustments kind of come there. I have had to make a few adjustments depending on where I am, kind of in the world. I talk uh, some about the healthcare system in America, and that was, I realized, oh, I'm in Canada when I was in Canada in Vancouver. And I was like, this is maybe a little foreign to people. So I had to add a line or two to kind of clarify uh-huh. our medical system and, and and that kind of thing. So those are the kinds of adjustments that I'm making. Um, and, and you do make adjustments of like what worked, what didn't work, but like traditional theater you let it go for a while and then and then revisit it later. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. So uh, is this your uh is this your only show that you've you've created f- for Fringe this Holio? Yes, this is my first show. Okay. I say first because there's others upstairs okay. playing around in my brain. So <laughs> Great. So is it is it is it fair to say that once you uh, start doing this you get hooked? You either get you either get completely defeated right out of the gate or you're hooked, maybe. I think so. I have found that with other fringe artists as well. It It's a lovely little community, especially if you're really intentional about investing in the people. And I've got a good friend that's coming to Denver uh, that I met actually in Vancouver. He's fantastic. And he got bit by the bug, if you will, in Vancouver. That was his first festival. And his name's Travis Abels and really, really great show. Um so yeah, we do. We get hooked, and it's it's fun, but it's we- it's weary. It's weary work. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I also wanted to ask you, like, given the kind of uh, the nature of your show, and you have children, um, at what point, at what age do you think you'll you'll let them see the show? I put on my marketing that the show is for eighteen and up. Mm-hmm. I talk about my show with my kids and uh, I tell them that I would love for them to see the show when it's age appropriate for them. And one of my children is a lot more innocent, if you will. She loves little kid things and and at sixteen, I think a sixteen year old, if they're kind of mature, would love this show. But her would not like uh-huh. she might need to wait till she's like 25 you know? <laughs> <laughs> she's just that's just her personality and then my other child uh you know just we'll see kind of how she develops she's still uh she's still she's finishing out elementary school and she's very much into theater and so if she gets up into that 16 17 year old range and and I kind of see how she perceives the world and how she deals with the world I wouldn't have a problem with her coming to the show i do i am bringing my children to this festival because we have a lot of family in denver and i am planning to pimp them 100 percent passing out postcards come see my mommy's <laughs> show i mean who can say no to cute little kids you know yeah it's about toys kind of um i know yeah. right <laughs> it's not it's not all well, about vibrators but um, yeah, yeah. It's a fun of course festival, uh, right? <laughs> kids are always ahead of, of wherever we think they are anyway so it's not like you'd be probably show them anything that they didn't know about in one way or another but uh, so absolutely uh, great and then how long is the performance that you're that, uh, of holio 60 now, minutes okay wow that's yeah. a lot long time so, to be on stage by yourself it is it, most fringe shows are about 45 to 60 minutes a lot of um a lot of them are close to 60 minutes 
mine, I interact with the audience a lot. So that's really fun for some people that freaks them out. And I've had audience members tell me, I don't want to say anything because I don't want to mess you up. I'm so afraid. And I was like, yes, uh, dude, I'm an improviser. You cannot say anything Uh to mess me up. And I've done a lot of work to make the audience feel safe uh, and to make them feel like they can't say anything wrong. So that is fun. I do get to have a little break there. It's not just me the whole time. Uh-huh. So the audience does get to participate. Okay. Great. Great. Um, well, um, oh, oh, back to your podcast. Are you going to be uh, doing some shows from Denver Fringe, like interviewing some of the, the other artists, things like that? I have a couple of artists lined up to be on the show before the Fringe. So people can listen to the podcast and hear about their shows. I'm really excited to interview them. And then while I'm there, this will be my first time taking the podcast on the road. And I would love to interview people. Um, so it's the play on words, right? What the fringe. So, uh-huh. you know, WTF, I use that all the time. Yes. And I'm going to call it, uh, I think, so we're, we're getting into the nitty gritty here, secrets that may or may not happen. Uh, I'm going to call it uh, WTF quickies. Um, it's where I interview fringe artists and they pitch their show and maybe share some information about like, what's been a challenge for you? What advice do you have for other fringers? And so after I finish with a festival, the plan is to do kind of like a special episode where I play all of these little, sh- very short interviews of fringe artists. So my goal is to elevate other fringe artists. That's one of my goals with this podcast. and to give them a place to um, have a platform to talk about their show, to get some press review, if you will. So I'll always have like a little quote or something that's complimentary. I I, I made a vow that uh, I will always find something nice to say about your show because it's so hard. And there was a show that I saw that I was, I did feel like I wasted 45 minutes of my life sitting through it. Uh-huh. And I was like, How, what do I say? Yeah. And I was like, this is, and I was like, he had really good masks. Like he had a lot of right. masks. And so like, you know, you can kind of tell by how much I gush or what I say, you know, yeah. might give you an indication on what I think about the show, but it's, yeah. it's, I'm not a critic. So it's always the, you know, as someone who does write criticism and, and has also gotten to, be part of this Denver or Colorado theater community and made a lot of friends there. It's it can be a challenge, you know, especially if you see something you, you really don't like and like one of your buddies directed it or is in it or or something like that. You know, it's but you know the alternative is you know you can't go out there and crow about something that, that sucks. Right, and, I'm not going to do that by any means. But I'm also like a peer, so I have right. to kind of balance that line really carefully to not. um really hurt someone's feelings. I know that when you're a reviewer, you don't always necessarily take that into account when you have to be honest to let the people know about, you know, whether the show was good or not. Um, there's ways to do it delicately, but uh, yeah. the plan is to be positive. And speaking of it, it's probably tough for fringe performers to get reviewed. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, outlets that do theater criticism want to have a show that's going to be around long enough so that the review is got some relevance to a show that people could go and see rather than something that just ended. So has is, is that been your experience? Absolutely. There are some festivals that are longer that try to work with reviewers, especially if it's like a 10 or 12 day festival that are going over two weeks and the reviewers will come out and review at the beginning of the festival. So then people can read those reviews and those ticket sales will increase towards the end of the festival. Right. And as fringers, as a, you know, fringer, I'm so appreciative for a festival that works really hard to get that done because that press review, anything means so much to us and really helps us to promote our show. Right. Yeah. You can use those blurbs for, for years, uh, you know, on your site and your publicity material. So so yeah, we uh, last year we got out and uh, covered some stuff. I'm hoping to uh, put together a little more of a like a I don't know task force or something to try and get to, uh, you know cover this stuff and 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 you know kick them out quickly. You know maybe shorter shorter things that we can just get out really quickly, uh, and and we'll see what we can do. So um, that's great. awesome. Well, so uh, so Denver Fringe is June 6th through 9th. Uh, you can find out all about it on DenverFringe.org. Uh, definitely check out Lauren's uh, podcast, uh, What the Fringe, anywhere you get your audio stuff. Uh, 
and uh, your show, Holy O, is uh, being performed June 6th at 8, June 7th at 9.30, and June 9th at 5.30 at Big Up Studios, which is at 3410 Blake Street in Denver. So uh, I will definitely try and get out to see to see your show and uh, uh, look forward to, to seeing you there. I would love that. I look forward to seeing you there and go see as many shows. It's like you can get a theater ticket for $70 and see one show come to fringe and you can see like five. Yeah. So that's a good deal. It's a good yeah. deal. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, Lauren Hans, uh, thanks again for being on the onstage Colorado podcast. Alex, thank you. All right. Well, that's it for this week's episode of the onstage Colorado podcast. Thanks so much to Lauren Hans for uh, walking us through kind of like her take on fringe festival and, and uh, her her own journey, and and some of the ways that uh, you know those performers put their things together, and and what it takes. It's you know, it's 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 not something anybody does to become wealthy. <laughs> you know, you do it for the love. Uh, but the funk, you know, French festivals really have. Uh, it's a great venue for different kinds of theater. Uh, usually, you know, shorter pieces, a lot of a lot of one person uh, shows that are you know maybe forty five minutes long, things like that, and and a bunch of other stuff. So. Uh, we'll have more information about the Denver Fringe Festival on the site coming up because, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Tony, there's a, really it's, a, it's their biggest biggest one ever coming up. So. Uh, next week, uh, we'll be back. I did an interview with Chris Medina from Funky Little Theater Company in Colorado Springs. It was fun to talk to him about, you know, uh, keeping keeping a little theater like that together for, uh, uh, you know, over a decade. And they've moved several times. Uh, they've also got some some uh, neat programs that they do. One of them is, uh, you know, a thing where you can, if you bring your kids, they'll, they've got a little daycare there and because uh, their theater is in a community center that has its own daycare. So they've set up a thing where you can drop kids off and they'll have fun uh, doing stuff while you go see a play. So uh, they've got a, sh- a very silly sounding little show coming up called, I think it's called Four Old Broads, <laughs> which is uh, 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 obviously a comedy of some sort. So uh, uh, come back uh, next week for that one. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your audio stuff. And uh, yeah, share it with people. Uh, the more the more uh, listeners we, we got, the better. And, and in fact, I, Chris Medina told me that he listens to the pod regularly. So I was like, cool, another fan. Uh, so thanks for that, Chris. Uh, and be sure to check out all of the reviews, news, uh, or other podca- podcast episodes and our full statewide theater calendar on the website at onstagecolorado.com. I'm Alex Miller. I'm Tony Tresco. And we'll see you at the show. Yep, we'll be there. <laughs> <laughs>